All right, today we're going to talk about the special senses. This is going to be the last chapter of the nervous system. So we're getting close to being done. So with our special senses, we have olfaction, which is smell, and taste, gustation. These are both going to be chemical senses. Vision or sight is going to be a photo sense. Hearing, equilibrium are both mechanical sensations, and these are all going to use special sensory receptors. So they're going to be localized. They're confined to the head region. You can't smell with any other part of your body other than your nose. The receptors are not free nerve endings they're going to have special receptor cells. So there's between 10 and 100 million receptors in the olfactory epithelium on the roof of the nasal cavity. It's about five square centimeters. There's three types of cells in there. Olfactory receptors, which are going to be bipolar neurons, supporting cells, which are pseudostratified columnar epithelium, and then basal stem cells, which are going to be mitotic cells that will produce new receptors. These are one of the few neurons that can actually replace themselves in a mature human. So while we have lots of sensory receptors in there, ours are still not as good as your dog's. So your olfactory or Bowman's glands are gonna secrete mucus, and then you've got the olfactory hairs, which are tiny hairs with olfactory receptors on there that will bind to the odor molecules. These are not the same thing as the nose hairs you see inside your nose. So once these tiny hairs bind to the receptors, it will send an action potential to the olfactory nerve. So here you can see where you would have these tiny little ciliated receptors in here, how that nerve is going to come back up and through, pierces through the cribriform plate, and then it will connect with the olfactory nerve and join into the olfactory tract. So genetic evidence does suggest that there are hundreds of primary scents. So in olfactory reception, you have a generator potential that will develop and then trigger one or more nerve impulses. We adapt to odors quickly, and the threshold of smell is low. It only takes a few molecules of a certain substance in the air for them to be able to be smelled. However, you will adapt to them very quickly, so you won't smell it for very long. Your olfactory receptors convey the nerve impulses to the olfactory nerves. That will transfer to the olfactory bulbs and then the olfactory tract and into the cerebral cortex and the temporal lobe. That will also make connections with the hypothalamus and limbic system. There's no synapse in the thalamus for the arriving information. So hypoosmia is a reduced ability to smell. This affects about half of people over age 65 and 75% of those over age 80. So if you're around somebody who is an older person and they're wearing a lot of fragrance, they can't tell. So it can be caused by neurological changes, drugs, the effects of smoking. So with a smoker, this will happen much earlier in life. So the odorants bind to the receptors, the sodium channels open, you have depolarization, the nerve impulse is triggered. This is just showing this pathway coming in and heading up to the brain. So adaptation is a decrease in sensitivity. It's going to decrease 50% in one second, and it can be complete in one minute. So if you are in a stinky room, within about a minute, it will become less intense and less bothersome. So it's got a low threshold. With natural gas, they put in methyl mercaptan to make it smell worse is a warning to us because with something like that that's so dangerous to have, you want to be able to sense that smell very quickly so that you can do something about the situation. So taste is a chemical sense as well. In order for this to be detected, the molecules have to be dissolved. About 80% of taste is dependent upon smell for full perception. So when you can't smell things, so if your sinuses are congested, whether it be sickness or allergies, you'll lose a lot of your taste. We've got six primary tastes, sweet, salty, sour, bitter. Umami is the savory flavors, things that can be enhanced with MSG. Sometimes it's described as the flavor of meat, cheese, and mushrooms, and then water. The threshold for bitter is the lowest, so it takes the least amount of bitter to be able to taste it, and the highest is for sweet. 
So you have the lowest adaptation for bitter, the highest for sweet. So if you're constantly exposed to sweet things, you're going to want them to just be sweeter and sweeter. So the gustatory pore is the opening of a taste bud on the surface of the oral mucosa. That's going to have gustatory hairs of the specialized neuroepithelial gustatory cells, which are your taste receptors. So they're clustered in these taste buds and associated with the lingual papillae. Taste buds are going to have basal cells that appear to be stem cells. So these gustatory cells extend taste hairs through a narrow pore, a tasting pore. You have supporting epithelium around there. The types of lingual papillae we have, circumvallate are going to be on the back of the tongue. Fungiform are found all over. Foliate are in the lateral margins of the tongue. These taste buds are gone after childhood. And then the filiform are found all over the tongue. They're for friction, not for taste. So if you want to see an example of these working versus not working, one of the things, if you give a dog something, you put it on the floor, you'll notice they can lick it and pick it up. If you want to see something that doesn't have good friction, put a piece of watermelon on the floor for the dog to try and pick up. And they have a really hard time getting the friction on that. So here's some pictures of the different types of taste buds. And again, some more pictures of the different types of taste buds. So the receptor potentials develop in the gustatory hairs, and they're going to cause neurotransmitters to release that will give rise to the nerve impulses. So with taste, you have complete adaptation in one to five minutes. So that can be kind of unfortunate. If you get some good chocolate, you've got about five minutes of enjoying it, and then it's going to be adapted to and not noticeable. The threshold tastes vary among the four primary tastes. So we're most sensitive to bitter flavors. And in the plant world, a lot of the bitter alkaloids are going to fall into that category and they're poisonous. We're least sensitive to salty and sweet. So you have a dissolved substance that will contact the gustatory hairs and the receptor potential will end up triggering a neurotransmitter release. And the nerve impulse is going to be formed in the first order neuron. So this shows the gustatory pathway going up. So cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve is going to serve the anterior two thirds of the tongue. The posterior one third of the tongue is going to be served by cranial nerve nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve. That's also where your gag reflex is. Cranial nerve 10 is going to serve the palate and the epiglottis. So signals are going to travel to the thalamus or limbic system or hypothalamus. It leads to the solitary nucleus in the medulla and then to the thalamus and gustatory complex of the parietal lobe and the insula for perception and then the limbic system via the hypothalamus. So remember a lot of the limbic system is tied with emotion. So it's not surprising that we find it comforting to eat in times of stress. So the eye and vision, vision is the dominant sense in humans. 70% of your sensory receptors are in the eyes. 40% of the cerebral cortex is involved in processing visual information. So the eye takes up a lot. Your eyeball is your visual organ. The diameter is about 2.5 centimeters. Only the anterior one sixth is available. So what you see of your eye is actually a really small portion of it. It lies in the bony orbit and then it's surrounded by a protective cushion of fat. So we've got accessory structures, the eyelids or palpebrae, the eyelashes, the eyebrows, the lacrimal apparatus, and then you've got the extrinsic eye muscles, the superior and inferior rectus, lateral and medial rectus, and superior and inferior obliques. So here gives a nice little image of the eye from what you would see from the outside. And then here with this illustration, you can see more of the details going into things. So your eyelid tarsal plates give structure. They're where the orbicularis oculi muscles will attach to close the eyes. The tarsal glands, these are modified sebaceous oil glands in the tarsal plates. So the levator palpebrae superioris muscle is going to lift the upper lid voluntarily. It will insert on the tarsal plate. 
The conjunctiva is the transparent mucous membrane. It's stratified columnar epithelium, so it actually lines the eyelid and covers the eyeball. You've got the palpebral conjunctival and the bulbar conjunctival. The bulbar is going to cover the white of the eye, but not the cornea. It's going to be the transparent tissue over the iris and pupil. Your lacrimal apparatus is responsible for tears. Tears are going to have a little bit of mucus in them, antibodies, and lysozyme. The lacrimal gland is in the orbit and it's in the superior lateral portion. So you can see here in the upper lateral eyelid, this is why the eyes will get so puffy when you cry. So tears will pass out through the puncta into the canaliculi into a sac, and then they will drain here into the nasolacrimal duct. That nasolacrimal duct will empty into the nasal cavity. So normally it's gonna evaporate before you get down in there, but if you're producing a lot of tears, then your nose will actually begin to run. So you have about a milliliter of tears produced a day, and they get spread over the eyes by blinking. So the extrinsic eye muscles here, this just gives a nice summary of what the eye muscles do and which cranial nerves control it. So this is showing, again, these different muscles of the eye. So this is showing a little bit more anatomical view, and this is showing from the front. So the eye is a sphere with a bulge, which is going to be the cornea on the front, and a stem in the back, which is your optic nerve. The outside's covered by a outer covering, your fibrous tunic. There's three tunics in the eyes. You've got a fibrous, vascular, and sensory or retinal tunic, and then two chambers, an anterior and posterior, that are separated by the lens and iris. So your anterior chamber is filled with aqueous humor. The posterior chamber is filled with vitreous humor. Your visual receptor field is gonna be the retina. It occupies the major portion of the posterior wall of the eye. So the light that reaches the retina is going to be regulated by the iris. So you would have the retina in the back here. Here is the lens. You're going to have the iris here that will control the size of the pupil. So looking at the outer layer or fibrous layer, it's going to be dense connective tissue. You've got the sclera, which is the white of the eye, and then the cornea. We'll have the middle vascular layer, the uvea. That's going to include the choroid, which is going to be the posterior, and it will give some pigment, and then the ciliary body. The muscles are going to control the lens shape. So then you'll have processes from the ciliary body that will secrete the aqueous humor. And the zonule attaches the lens. So the iris is on the inner layer. And then you've got the sensory functions, which are the retina and the optic nerve. So retina and optic nerve are here. The iris will be up here, the lens. This is showing the three layers of the eye again. And this one also shows the tunics of the eye. So here's your anterior cavity and your posterior cavity. So the cornea should be transparent. So this is the part that is affected by cataracts. And with cataracts, it basically, if you imagine smearing butter on a window, that's what it's like for a person to look through cataracts. So it helps to focus the light with refraction. When it's abnormally shaped, it can lead to astigmatism. There's three layers, the non-keratinized stratus squamous epithelium. You'll have collagen fibers and fibroblasts, and then simple squamous epithelium. So transplants of this are common and very successful. There's no blood vessels in it, so no antibodies are there to cause rejection. The eyes are fairly easy to transplant tissue in, and it's nourished by the tears and aqueous humor. The sclera, or the white of the eye, is dense irregular connective tissue. It's going to have a lot of collagen and fibroblasts. It helps to provide shape and support. At the junction of the sclera and the cornea is an opening called the scleral venous sinus. 
and it's going to be posteriorly pierced by cranial nerve 2. So your iris is the colored portion of the eye. It's in the shape of a flat donut, and it's suspended between the cornea and the lens. The hole in the center is the pupil. That's going to regulate how much light enters the eye. So the circular muscles contract in bright light to shrink the pupil. The radial muscles are going to contract in dim light to enlarge the pupil. The choroid, you're going to have pigmented epithelial cells here, or melanocytes, and blood vessels. It's going to provide nutrients to the retina. And then the black pigment in the melanocytes will help to absorb the scattered light. The ciliary body you know, will have ciliary processes in there that are folds on the ciliary body to secrete the aqueous humor. The ciliary muscle is smooth muscle that alters the shape of the lens. So this here you can see an eyeball that is dilated, one that is con just normal, and one that is really constricted. So pupil constriction and dilation is going to control how much light enters the eye. The brighter the light, the more the pupils should constrict. So the vascular tunic or lens. So this, the lens itself is avascular. It's got crystalline proteins arranged in layers like an onion. There's a clear capsule and it's perfectly transparent. The lens is held in place by suspensory ligaments and it's going to focus the light on the fovea, which is in the back of the eye. So the suspensory ligaments attached to the lens and ciliary process, they're going to control the tension on the ligaments in the lens. So the retina, it's on the posterior three quarters of the eyeball. So you, this is the retina here. When somebody is doing an eye exam on you and they get really close and look into the back of your eye, this is what they're looking at. The optic disc is going to have the optic nerve exit out the back of the eyeball. So your central retina blood vessels are going to fan out to supply nourishment to the retina. They're visible for its inspection. So you can actually see evidence of hypertension and diabetes here. With hypertension, you'll start to see some of the blood vessels look like they're blown out. They're tiny little blood vessels. With diabetes, some of the blood vessels would be damaged or missing because high blood glucose is damaging to blood vessels. So with a detached retina, it's usually from trauma. You have fluid between the layers and you'll end up with distortion or blindness. So most of the time it can be surgically corrected, but it's not something to wait on. It's something that needs to be dealt with immediately. So the photoreceptors, their shapes of their outer segments differ. The rods, you have about 125 million of them. These are specialized for black and white vision and work well in dim light. They allow you to discriminate different shades in dark and light, and you can see shapes and movement. These are going to be what helps you see if something's moving out of the corner of your eye. The cones, you only have about 6 million of them. They're specialized for color vision and sharpness of vision. They work well in bright light to give high visual acuity. They're most densely concentrated in the central fovea, which is a little depression in the center of the macula lutea. The macula lutea is the exact center of the posterior portion of the retina, and it's going to correspond to the visual axis of the eye. So this area is sharpest in vision because of the high concentration of cones. Rods are actually absent from the fovea and macula, and then they increase in density as you move towards the periphery of the retina. So here you can see the, the macula lutea as well as the central fovea. And then there's your optic disc. So when we look at the layers of the retina, you've got pigmented epithelium. This is the non-visual portion that will absorb stray light and help to keep the image clear. You've got three layers of neurons. You've got the photoreceptor, the bipolar neuron, and the ganglion neuron. And then you have two other types of cells that help to modify the signal 
the horizontal cells and amacrine cells. So this is showing again. Here's a nice stained slide. Here's a visual image, image an illustration. So light is going to penetrate the retina, and the rods and cones will transduce the light into action potentials. Those will excite bipolar neurons that in turn excite ganglion cells. The axon of the ganglion cells are going to form the optic nerve, leaving the eyeball. Where this happens, you have a blind spot. Then it will send the information to the thalamus and the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. So again, here's a really nice picture of a retina. And then you can see that optic disc. So this shows the circulation of the aqueous humor inside the eye. So with vision, we have refraction. This is showing here how you have this image out in front. It comes in and it's projected upside down on the back of the eyeball. This can show how light can bend, how you can have the divergent rays, and then it flips it over and makes the image smaller for accommodation. So problems of refraction. The emetropic eye is a normal eye with light focused properly. The myopic eye is one that's nearsighted. So the focal point is out in front of the retina, so it can be corrected with a concave lens. The hyperopic eye, the person is farsighted. The focal point is behind the retina, so this can be corrected with a convex lens. So today we actually can have very lightweight, thin lenses when a person has to wear glasses or corrective lenses. It isn't like the old days where they talked about the Coke bottle glasses where they had to do really thin lenses or really thick lenses to correct your vision. So here it's showing how you have normal eye, nearsighted, farsighted, and the correction that the lens makes. So with nearsighted, you're able to see things that are closer. With farsighted, you're able to see things farther away. So the first step in vision, vision transduction is the absorption of light by the phyto, photopigments. So your visual pigments, they're going to stimulate your rods and cones, which have the photoreceptors. They're going to have the photopigments that consist of opsin, which is a protein, and retinol, which is a derivative of vitamin A. So here you can see them coming in. So with isomeriz isomerization, light causes the cis retinol to straighten and become the trans retinol shape. When you have bleaching, the enzymes separate the trans retinol from the opsin. So you have a colorless final product. And then with regeneration and darkness, an enzyme is going to convert the trans retinol back to cis retinol. You'll have the resynthesis of the photopigment. So this is what happens when you're looking at something in the light, and then you have it separate, you have the bleaching, and then it coming back. So if you can imagine when you look into bright headlights at night and you get the night blindness, that's this temporary bleaching that occurs. So here this is showing the release of the neurotransmitters in here. So you have cyclic GMP gated sodium channels. You're going to have the inflow of sodium. You're going to have the membrane potential of negative 30 millivolts and glutamates released at the synaptic terminals that inhibit the bipolar cell. So that's what happens in darkness. In light, you have isomerization of the retinal that activates the enzyme that breaks down cyclic GMP. You've got the sodium channels that will get open, the inflow of sodium, hyperpolarization of the receptor potential, and glutamate release is turned off, which will excite the bipolar neuron. So convergence is when one cone cell synapses onto one bipolar cell that produces the best visual acuity. 
you have 600 rod cells synapse on a single bipolar cell. It's going to increase the light sensitivity, although it would give you slightly blurry images. You have 126 million photoreceptors that converge on 1 million ganglion cells. So the horizontal cells are going to enhance the contrast in the visual scene because they'll laterally inhibit bipolar cells in the area. The amacrine cells are going to excite bipolar cells if the levels of illumination change. So this is the visual pathway. So you're going to have your field of vision out in front here. The information is going to travel through the optic nerve. Then it's going to come to the optic chiasm, where the medial fibers are going to decussate or cross. Then you have the optic tract. It's going to go through the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, travel back through the optic radiations to the primary visual area of the cortex. So it's Brodmann's area 17 in the occipital lobe. So when you look at this picture here, you can see medial fibers crossing, the lateral fibers stay on the same side. So what this part of the eye sees is over here, what this part sees is over here, what this one sees is over here, what this one sees over here. So the visual fields actually cross in front. So fibers from the nasal half of the retina are going to cross in the optic chiasm. That's what you've got going on here. So the left occipital lobe is going to receive visual images from the right side of an object through the impulses from the nasal half of the right eye and the temporal half of the left eye. So we go to the left occipital lobe here, and when you follow these fibers up, you're going to see this part and this part. So the left occipital lobe sees the right half of the world. The right occipital lobe sees the left half of the world. So it's the occipital lobe that sees the other side, not the eyes. The eyes actually have split fields of vision. So this is showing here, this coming down on the contralateral path and the ipsilateral path. And then you've got the contralateral path and ipsilateral. So remember, contralateral is the opposite side. Ipsilateral is the same side. So disorders of the eyes. Blind spots are a small portion of the visual field of each eye that corresponds to where the optic disc is within the retina. There's no photoreceptors here, so there's no image detection. It's not really a disorder. It never had vision. Glaucoma, it's a condition that damages the optic nerve. It's often caused by abnormally high blood pressure in your eye. Cataracts, they're cloudy areas in the lens of the eye. They can cause vision changes. So when we look at the ear, we divide the ear into three regions. Your external or outer ear is going to collect sound waves. So it's from here on out. The middle ear is going to start at the tympanic membrane. It's a small air-filled cavity in the temporal bone. It's going to have the auditory ossicles. So these little guys here, the malleus, incus, and stapes, they're really small little bones. They can all fit on your pinky. And then you'll have the oval window and round window. So right in here. And then the internal ear is also called the labyrinth because it's got a complicated series of canals. So the job of the external ear is to collect sound waves and pass them inward. So the part you see on the side of your head is the auricle, and then you've got the pinna down at the bottom. It's elastic cartilage covered with skin. It does have blood flow in it, so if you poke it, it will bleed. You can also feel it. There's nerve fibers in there. You've got your external auditory canal. It's a curved one-inch tube of cartilage, and then it becomes bone leading into the temporal bone. You have the ceruminous glands in there that are going to produce earwax. The skin actually grows from medial to lateral, so things that are caught in the wax get hauled out as the skin grows out. Then you've got the tympanic membrane or eardrum. So in here you've got epidermis, collagen, and elastic fibers in simple cuboidal epithelium. If you perforate the eardrum, a hole is present. 
At the time, you can have pain, ringing, hearing loss, and dizziness. It can be caused by explosion, scuba diving, ear infection, severe pressure changes. The middle ear cavity is air-filled in the temporal bone, separated from the external ear by the eardrum and from the inner internal ear by the oval and round windows. So those ossicles are connected by synovial joints. The malleus attaches to the eardrum, then the incus and the stapes to the membrane of the oval window. The stapedius and tensor tympani muscles attach to the ossicles. So this auditory tube or eustachian tube here is going to lead to the nasopharynx. It's what's going to help to equalize pressure on both sides of the eardrum. So when your ears pop, what it is is this opens up and allows pressure to come in here and equal with what's on the other side. So it does connect to the mastoid bone. When there's infection there, it's mastoiditis. The fenestra cochlea or round window is the small membrane covered opening between the middle and ear. The fenestra vestibuli or oval window is a membrane covered opening that leads from the middle ear to the vestibule of the inner ear. The vibrations travel through the three ossicles into the inner ear. So here are some pictures of the middle ear. So here you can actually see the malleus. And then here's the inner surface of the tympanic membrane, the stapedius muscle. Incus is back here. So the stapedius muscle will attach to the stapes. It prevents very large vibrations of the stapes from loud noises. The tensor tympani is going to attach to the malleus. It limits the movement of the malleus and stiffens the eardrum to prevent damage. So we've got a lot of pictures of the ear here. So your bony labyrinth, it's going to protect the membranous labyrinth. It's a series of cavities in the petrous portion of the temporal bone, and it can be divided into three areas named based on their shape. We have the semicircular canals, so they are semicircular shape, and the vestibule, and they're both going to contain receptors for equilibrium. And then we have the cochlea, which is a snail shell shaped spiral canal that will have receptors for hearing. The bony labyrinth is lined with periosteum and is going to contain a fluid called perilymph. The fluid chemically is very similar to cerebrospinal fluid, and it's going to surround the membranous labyrinth. The membranous labyrinth is a series of sacs and tubes that are inside of these structures, and they have the same general form as the bony labyrinth. They're lined with epithelium, and they're going to have a fluid called endolymph, which is similar to the intracellular fluid. So the vestibule is going to have the oval central portion of the bony labyrinth. The membranous labyrinth in the vestibule is going to have two sacs called the utricle and saccule. So the, they're anterior to the, vesti anterior to the vestibule, you have the cochlea, and it's the bony spiral canal. It makes almost three turns around a central bony core. That bony core is the modiolus. And then you've got your semicircular canals. They're going to go upward and posterior from the vestibule. They're in approximately right angles, so they would be like in the X, Y, and Z axis. At the end of each canal is an enlargement called the ampulla. Portions of the membranous labyrinth that lie inside the semicircular canals are the semicircular ducts or membranous semicircular canals. So the cranial nerves to this area You've got cranial nerve 8, you'll have the vestibular portion and the cochlear portion. So this is just showing the pathway of hearing. The noise is going to come in through the external auditory canal, vibrate the tympanic membrane, it travels through the malleus, incus, and stapes, into the middle ear, and into the inner ear, into the cochlea. So your auricle is going to collect the sound waves. Makes the eardrum vibrate. There's a slow vibration in response to low pitch sounds, rapid vibration in response to high pitch sounds. 
there are sound waves that are outside of what you can hear. And as you get older, you will be able to hear less of them. The ossicles vibrate since the malleus is attached to the eardrum. The stapes pushes on the oval window. It's going to produce fluid pressure waves in the scala vestibuli and tympani. The oval window vibration is 20 times more vigorous than the eardrum, but the frequency of the vibration is unchanged. So pressure fluctuations inside the cochlear duct move the hair cells against the tectorial membrane. So those microvilli are bent and that's what's going to produce the receptor potentials. So here you can see the stapes pushes on that fluid, the oval window. With the helicotrema, you have vibration move into the scala tympani. Fluid vibration dissipates at the round window where it bulges, and then the central structure in the cochlear duct is vibrated. So if you look at cross sections of the cochlea, it shows it's divided into three channels by partitions that together it makes a Y shape. The channel above the bony partition is the scala vestibule. It's at the ends of the oval window. The channel below is the scala tympani, which is at the ends of the round window. They both contain perilymph and they're completely separated except at the opening at the apex of the cochlea called the helicotrema. The third channel is between the wings of the Y. It is the cochlear duct, the scala media. The vestibular membrane is going to separate the cochlear duct from the scala vestibuli and the basilar membrane separates the cochlear duct from the scala tympani. So you can look and see here scala vestibuli, scala tympani, and you've got your basilar membrane there. So this makes that Y shape, the bony shelf of the central modiolus. So it's vestibular membrane above and basilar membrane below in the cochlear duct. So the fluid vibrations will affect the hair cells inside. So if we scale back a little bit and zoom out, so you've got those three fluid filled chambers. The vibration of the stapes upon the oval window sends the vibration of the fluid into the scala vestibuli. So you have 16,000 hair cells that are going to have 30 to 100 stereo stereocilia or microvilli. They'll make contact with the tectorial membrane. It's a gelatinous membrane that overlaps the spiral organ of Corti. So the basal sides of the inner hairs will synapse with the first order neurons and their cell body is in the spiral ganglion. So here, the hearing process summarized, you have the sound waves of the tympanic membrane, moves the tympanic membrane and displaces the ossicles. It's going to move the shapes of the oval window, establish pressure, into the perilymph of the vestibular duct. It's going to distort the basilar membrane and the round window of the tympanic duct. The vibration of the basal membrane causes vibration against the hair cells of the tectorial membrane. And that information about the region and intensity of stimulation gets relayed to the CNS through the cochlear branch of cranial nerve 8. So with deafness, you can have nerve deafness or conduction deafness. With nerve deafness, there's possibly nerve damage, cranial nerve 8. But usually it's damage to the hair cells. Things like antibiotics can do this, high-pitched sounds, anti-cancer drugs. The louder the sound, the quicker the loss of hearing. A lot of times a movie theater is actually loud enough to cause a little bit of hearing damage within two hours. So a lot of times a person may fail to notice hearing loss until they have difficulty hearing frequencies of speech. With conduction deafness, you can have a perforated eardrum, otosclerosis. The vibrations are not going to be conducted to the hair cells. So this just gives you an idea of typical decibel levels, an example of where you would hear it, and how much time it takes to cause hearing damage. The louder it is, the less time it takes. So equilibrium is your balance. Static equilibrium is maintaining the body or the head relative to the force of gravity. 
the macular receptors within the saccule and utricle of the vestibule will do this. Dynamic equilibrium, this is going to be maintained by body position head during sudden movements. So dynamic means moving or changing. So it will pick up any type of rotation, deceleration, accelera acceleration. You have cristoreceptors within the ampulla of the semicircular ducts. So here you can see you've got the semicircular ducts within the ampulla and then the utricle and saccule. So this is showing here the macula of the saccule. So these are these little otoliths, the little ear stones in there. And these are the hair cells. So as long as these don't get stuck someplace they don't belong, things go pretty well. If they do get stuck where they don't belong, they can cause a lot of problems for people with vertigo, which can be pretty miserable. So the cell types in the macular region, you've got hair cells with stereocilia cilia, or the microvilli, and one cilia, the kinocilium. They're going to secrete a gelatinous layer. The gelatinous otolithic membrane is going to have those calcium carbonate crystals, the otoliths, that move when you tip your head, and that's going to tell you what position your head is in. So here it's detecting it being upright. When you move your head back, they slide downhill and distort hairs in the process so that you're aware of where your head is. So when you do that, the stereocilia or kinocilium result in the release of a neurotransmitter onto the vestibular branches of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So for the semicircular ducts, we've got an anterior, posterior, and lateral duct. So there's a small elevation within each of these. The hair cells are covered with the cupola, which is a gelatinous material. So when you move, the fluid in the canals tend to stay in place. So it will bend the cupola and bend the hair cells, altering the release of the neurotransmitter. So when you rotate Take your head, the cupola is sensing the movement and the change in the direction of the flow of the endolymph. So nerve signals get sent to the brain that indicate which direction the head has been rotating. So aging effects, never fun. Tympanic membrane gets less flexible, articulations between the ossicles stiffen and the round window may begin to ossify. So that is the nervous system.